Tô bem que não nada mesmo. Good. Yes. Okay, so um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Global Town Hall session on advancing uh, urban net zero and green transition with smart solutions. Um, this session is organized by the city of Kaohsiung and the Eclair Kaohsiung Capacity Center uh, as partner of this pavilion. And my name is Yixian Yang. I'm the director of Eclair KCC and will be the moderator of today's sessions. Um, so to set up the scene, uh, I would like to make some contextual remarks on why we are here to discuss my solution uh, for green transition and also for particular industrial cities. Um, I think the pain points um, from climate change are very clear. We see um, record breaking. Uh, do we have to? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we see record-breaking high temperatures, floodings, and um, extreme climatic events in all over the world. Um, and cities are at the for forefront of this uh, impact. And most of the time, uh, climate change not only uh, in intensify extreme weather events, uh, but also existing social economic problems that uh, cities are already facing or threatens other sustainability goals of the city. And in Kaohsiung, the city where I'm from, um, has just experienced the worst drought uh, for over 100 years, yes. Um, early this year, since there were no, zero typhoon that landed uh, Taiwan for three years in a row, and um, which uh, severely impact not just uh, drinking water, but also water supply for agriculture and also for other industrial use. While the city is very, uh, is trying to accelerate in, uh, its economic development. And in the meantime, uh, with the global goal to uh, achieve net zero emissions, uh, city and local governments are taking a bigger role and bigger mandate to uh, cut emissions, and which is particularly challenging for industrial cities uh, as well. But on the other hand, uh, we can see that net zero goal also brings opportunities to the city for take a new model and also to realign their policies to the new global standards. Um, so all in all, um, cities are uh, seeking innovations and new solutions for uh, to help combat these challenges in a smarter and a sustainable way. So um, in this session, I don't want to confine our uh, discussion in just typical smart city uh, technology. I would like to broaden the definition of uh, smart solution to innovative strategies and that leverage not just technology, but also smart governance, business models, and also um, and solution to enhance city performance uh, in sustainability and really address challenges uh, and solve problems. So before I introduce uh, our speakers today, I'd like to invite Mr. Imani Kumar, uh, the Deputy or Secretary, um, uh, Deputy Secretary General of the CLE to give us uh, remarks. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, Ishink. And uh, I'm I'm not there actually on on the agenda uh, from the beginning, but uh, my colleagues uh, from from uh, Taiwan have asked me to come here. Uh, there is a reason also. I just want to be here uh, because uh, exactly. I think if I'm not wrong, a month back I was in Taiwan, and I'm listening to the the cities from Taiwan uh, what they are doing uh, on the net zero uh, solutions. I was so fascinated, so fascinated to listen to them uh, that uh, uh, what is happening in the in the in the cities in Taiwan also, Taipei, New Taipei, uh, Kaohsiung, and uh, all these cities have their action plans ready. They have done their uh, carbon emission inventories. Uh, they have done their vulnerability assessments, and they also have taken up forward the, the actions they are, and they are really looking for any other best practices available in, in the world so that they can also, uh, uh, they can also 
take those best practices and utilize and use uh, and implement them on in in Taiwanese cities also on that and and I I just I was telling them on the day uh, when I when I met those cities in Taiwan. Uh, it's it's that we also want to learn from you. It's not just only that Taiwan cities are going to learn. So it is like a two-way process, not just that they are going to learn from other cities, other countries. I know that we have other other cities here speaking, uh, but but on both sides, I think we can learn from the, those cities and they can learn from other cities on that. So I'm so happy that uh, I'm uh, part of uh, this particular session. And I just want to, uh, again, congratulate uh, ICLI KCC uh, uh, for, uh, and also the city of Kaushing uh, for giving us uh, actually the opportunity to work with you and and also uh, to showcase that we we also have a partnership with uh, uh, Kaohsiung City uh, on the uh, Asia Leads partnership which uh, every year uh, uh, Kaohsiung City and the uh, 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 the national ministries are are uh, handling are, are implementing a, a organizing workshops uh, to showcase these best practices on both sides on that so i'm i'm happy that uh, we are all working together uh, this is a global cause it's not just only uh, one city or one one region will will work on that we know that from the regions uh, uh, city of committee of regions that we have our speaker here uh, so we will see that what what we can take it from this particular session and and at the same time i i just want to listen to uh, obviously all all the uh, speakers uh, so that we can as as a uh, uh, representative from the asia pacific region i can take forward uh, the lessons from this particular session on that so all the best for this session and uh, yeah thank you thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity uh, thank you kumar um, today we have a great set of speakers from industrial cities in uh, green transition from four different regions and uh, to share their case stories and I would like to briefly introduce them. Um, so um, first I would like to uh, introduce uh, Director Chang Rei Hun from Environmental Protection Bureau uh, representing Gaozhou City. She is in charge of the supervising the planning and delivery of Gaozhou's net zero plan and also urban resilience policy. Would you like to say hello to, uh, to, to the audience? Yes. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Kim Yao Chao, uh, Executive Director of the International Climate Development Institute, representing the program uh, of Global Call for Solutions hosted by the Gaozhong City Government. Welcome. And third, I would like to introduce uh, Councilor Nina Ratilanian. <laughs> Good, uh, from the city of Turku, and she's also a member of European Committee of Regions and uh, has been a firm advocate for cities taking climate actions and also for girls, yeah, welcome. <laughs> also, uh, we have two speakers uh, join us online. I'm not sure if we can uh, see their faces, but uh, perhaps I can introduce them later or... <laughs> okay, so... Um, so for the following time, we'll be having a presentation from each speaker, and I would like to encourage all participants here not to just see this uh, presentation, uh, just case stories, but also take them as effort to think about uh, the challenges we have and uh, what we can bring climate actions to our cities. And so for our first presentation uh, is brought by uh, Director General uh, Chang from Kaohsiung City uh, to start us off on the specific specific issues at hand. Uh, what are the priority challenges that uh, industrial city face in their uh, in their transition to net zero? And also how do they address um, these challenges in a smart way? Welcome, uh, Director General Chen. The floor is yours. Hi, hello everyone. And I'm Zhang Ruihun, Director of Environment Protection Bureau of Kaohsiung City Government. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity to share the experience of Kaohsiung City in promoting urban net zero transformation. This is today's outline. Firstly, let me introduce my country and my city. I come from Taiwan. 
which is Southeast Asia, surrounded by sea. The population is about 23 million. Taiwan is known for its technology industry, including companies such as TSMC, Acer, SASE, and ASUS. Kaohsiung City is the third largest city in Taiwan. It owns the largest port in Taiwan, which is also a major hub for industry, such as steel and uh, petrochemicals. The residents usually drive car or ride scooter for daily commutes. Each household on average possess two scooters. As a result, it becomes necessary to develop green transport, transportation system. Kaohsiung has, city has a tropical sun moon, a climate with abundant sunshine. Temperature is Kaohsiung range from 15 to 32 degrees Celsius. The primary source of rainfall come from typhoon and early summer rains. The carbon emission in Taiwan are around 275 million tons of carbon dioxide. As a major industrial city, Kaohsiung City's carbon emission stand at 57.37 million tons of carbon dioxide, accounting for 20% of the country's total. In 2021, we have decreased 30% of carbon emission compared to 2005. Our goal is achieve 30% reduction of emission by 2030 and to reach the net zero by 2050. If we look at emission structure. The industrial sector contributes the most, accounting for 80%, followed by residential, commercial, and the transportation sectors. The net zero strategy of Kaohsiung City can be divided into several key aspects, such as science based targets establishing regulation and uh, energy transition strategy. In the energy aspect, our primary strategy is to reduce fossil fuel and expand, expand the renewable energy resource like hydrogen and bioenergy. We joined the PPCA in 2020 and uh, initiated a coal reduction campaign our goal is to reach coal free at the coal generation facility by 2025. In the industrial aspect, we have implemented AI driving solution to assist in reducing emission in industrial process. The steel and petrochemical industry together account for 71% of Kaohsiung city emission. We use AI module to reduce steel making, making temperature and to decrease fuel consumption. For circular economy, Kaohsiung city is promoting the use of such recovered fuel and reutilizing button edge as construction materials. We are also creating a low carbon living environment to achieve carbon, low carbon lifestyle in Kaohsiung city. We plan to achieve two goals by 2030. The first one is to complete the MRT system. And then the second one is to build the e-bus system. We also encourage citizens to use public bicycle and the share vehicle by offering discount. For green building, we encourage citizens to store, install solar panel on their rooftops. 
implement vertical greenery on balconies and a settled rainwater harvesting system. We have established the Net Zero Institute, where we nurture the talent of industri industry transformation through general knowledge, certification, and a technical course. Also, the leading companies are sharing practical experience to the small and the medium companies. In the financial aspect, the city government allocated a net zero budget to support low carbon transformation. Actually, the city government assists industry for green finance and apply for carbon credit of reduction achievement, participating in market transaction to promote the green economy. Last but not the least, we consider just transition very important. Throughout the implementation of reduction policy, we equally care about the interest of our residential, resident and the industry. No one is left behind. To adapt to the climate change, an integrated platform is established to provide information on climate, air quality, water resource, agriculture, and the carbon emission. This platform provides the government and the citizen with real-time data for immediate response to prevent natural disasters such as flood and the typhoon. To keep up with international standards, Kaohsiung City has joined various organizations and initiatives, including PPCA, UCLG, and the city name. We also established the only eco-training center in East Asia. In 2023, we cooperate with international carbon inspection agency, such as BSI, PUV, and the DMV, for skill training in Next Zero Institute. This will conclude my presentation on Kaohsiung City Next Zero Transformation. I appreciate your attention and I hope each of you have the chance to visit Taiwan and Kaohsiung City. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director General Chen. Um, Kaohsiung City um, has 80%, or more than 80% of the emission comes from the industrial sector, so which is quite uh, challenging to uh, to reach net zero. And it cannot be done without uh, innovation, also cross-sectoral uh, cooperation and also partnership with private sectors. And which brings my next question to uh, our next speaker, Cam. So uh, you are working on this, this program um, on these uh, coastal solutions and in your experience, what are the enabling elements for cities building partnership and uh, are there any smart uh, smart bridge uh, to, to facilitate collaboration possibilities and uh, between cities and business solution providers? So, well, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Kim. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Yixuan, and uh, uh, it's my uh, honor and uh, uh, privilege to be here, and also uh, I'm so happy to see uh, the good friends, Junos here, Kuma, and both of you uh, went to Taiwan this year. So actually, as uh, our Director General Zhang just mentioned, Kaohsiung is a very typical uh, industrial city and has a very good uh, experience performance uh, before in Taiwan, but also we're facing the challenges because we occupy 20% uh, of carbon emission of uh, this country. And uh, it was the biggest uh, carbon emission uh, in the you know, whole country as a city. So uh, we believe uh, our challenges is also common challenges to all the different cities around the world. 
So since uh, last time we had a sustainable city forum in March, and uh, we invited uh, uh, we invited uh, Juno was there, and uh, so after that we think about uh, if we can invite all the different cities or entrepreneur around the world to uh, cooperate with us to have uh, you know better ideas, smart solutions with us. What can we do? And we can also share this experience to the other different cities. So we start this Call for uh, Global Solution project. Next page, please. Okay, so uh, for this part, I think um, we know that for the cities, we facing the most challenging part is energy. Surely, yeah, the energy fossil energy phase out is also one of the main discussion for today uh, as global star tech. I think they're going to discuss for NDC this year, but also not only for the national part. Different cities also have the challenges for uh, the, the energy transition. And also uh, for Kaohsiung, actually, in the past few years, during the pandemic, we have a lot of new investment come back to Kaohsiung. And the biggest semiconductor, uh, TSMC, they also put a lot of uh, new investment. So, uh, you know, we're facing the challenges. Uh, the, the economic growth, we have to put maintain that as growth. But uh, the new uh, energy part or renewable energy demand is huge. And also uh, for the carbon emission, we also have to put it down. So the energy transition is one of the main focus and surely for, for the uh, green living. And uh, as uh, Ethan just mentioned, I just correct that uh, we not just for three years, no typhoon, we have six years, no typhoon. Yes, <laughs> six years. So actually for past two years, uh, Kaohsiung uh, facing a very, very serious shortage of water. We have like a 100 year, period of drought. All the dams just, uh, the water uh, become the lowest record in the past two years. Yeah, so I do remember uh, in uh, the end of January, uh, Mayor Chen invited me to uh, the uh, city meeting and we also discussed uh, the vulnerability of the water shortage we face in the drought. Yeah, but then after that uh, we had typhoon uh, in August and uh, we have serious problem of flooding. Yeah, and the, the water, uh, the precipitation is like three times than before. Yeah, so you can see the, the frequency. So we have these challenges. So after that, we would like to invite all the uh, different cities around the world to say, okay, if you have good ideas, if you have good solutions, and if you already make uh, your city have transformation, please submit your solutions to us. We can discuss. And also our experience can also be your experience to the other different cities. So next page, please. Uh, the mayor will tell you how we proceed and then I'll explain more. Okay, please play the video. Yes, the update one. Hi, I am Chen Shimai, the mayor of Kaohsiung City. Kaohsiung is Taiwan's most important industrial city. In responding to the global net zero and sustainability trend, we have developed a complete net zero roadmap, strategy, and cooperation platform. From governance to industry and public participation, we are activating a comprehensive net zero transformation plan ranging from industry to daily life. In addition, Kaohsiung is also committed to achieving urban digital transformation by building a human-centric smart city. The 2024 Smart City Summit and Expo will be held in Kaohsiung next March. I would like to invite you to join this event and share your experience and achievement in net zero and digital transformation. Together, 
Let's build a net zero and sustainable future city. Here are six selected proposals on display. Grundfos Distributed Pumping System achieves a 50% reduction in energy consumption by balancing through a refrigeration water system. Embrace green living, elevating lifestyles with low carbon transport and electrified mobility solutions. The EV Bus Smart Kit utilizes advanced battery management, electric propulsion, and real-time monitoring to achieve efficient energy utilization and data-driven insights. Kaohsiung Smart Digital Platform Thales Smart Digital Platform leverages AI, big data, and automation to establish an intelligent information center. Recycle Plastic 3D Printing Technology Recycle Plastic 3D Printing Technology is a technique that utilizes recycled muscles as printing materials. Reco Glass Reco Glass is the world's first glass manufactured using air filters containing CO2, providing a CO2 capture feature. Infrared an intelligent framework for resilient design. Infrared utilizes an AI simulation predictive model to assist in urban planning for climate mitigation solutions. This is a great opportunity to share knowledge and experience and learn from each other. Together, we can make a difference and build a sustainable future for our cities and the planet. Uh, next page, yep. So um, after the uh, the event in March, uh, we invite all the different uh cities around the world at different uh entrepreneurship or uh different enterprise. If you have good solutions, to submit your proposals around the world, and we also invite uh the global uh leading experts uh in different aspects, including public health, including uh, the team who charge in EU for uh, 100 uh, uh, cities transitions, and also including a lot of different um, ex experts uh, in uh, like, a, you know, carbon sink forest or industrial, all the different uh, experts. And we have the uh, review process. And then, okay, next page, please. Uh, we are very, very pleased that uh, just very uh short uh this period like uh six year uh, six months, uh, we receive uh, more than uh, thirty uh, submissions uh, from uh, more than twenty different countries, and submit their different uh uh, uh, uh solutions to our uh Kaohsiung city, and including uh, uh from various you know different uh, kind of solutions. And as the mayor just said, uh, we are not facing the climate issues only. Uh, we also facing the uh, digital transitions in the meantime. So we believe smart solution is our uh, very good approach to sub to to uh, solve the the climate issues. So after that, we select uh, the best uh, practice of that for fifteen. The all the different experts help us. Uh, to select uh, 15 uh, different cases. And surely uh, for the different cases, we will have the publication for next year. But also after that, as uh, the video just showed uh, for, from this different uh, 15 cases, uh, the experts identified uh, six best practice to say we have potential to implement in Kaohsiung. That's why we say potential because uh, from this six, of them, we will choose two, and we will have the POC project in Kaohsiung implement uh, since uh, next year in Kaohsiung. So that means if that could succeed in Kaohsiung, could have to succeed in the other city. If they face in this kind of uh, tra transitions and we have the industrial uh, transitions to the new uh, green economies, yeah, we can have a, like a demonstration site in Kaohsiung. So for that part, uh, we are under the negotiation uh, process with this six professional team. And also if two of them are to be chosen uh, next year, uh, we will start the POC. And surely for next year, as the uh, mayor just said, uh, we will invite all the different experts and the city and the solutions uh, to come to Kaohsiung. So next year, in fact, uh, the Sustainable City Forum 
uh, we will call it the next stage uh, to be a city corp. We hope uh, this sustainable city forum uh, in March every year we have implemented that for eight years already. And uh, both of you have been our keynote speakers. So uh, we hope this platform could be a very, very good platform uh, uh, venue uh, to to host and to invite all the cities and also experts around the world. We can face in uh, the challenge and also we find a solution together. So thank you very much. I think uh, we hope to see you again in Kaohsiung next March. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kim, for sharing um, this is taxing uh, program. Um, I would like to also underline that uh, it takes uh, practice for cities as well to really embrace uh, innovations and also working with uh, private sectors. And um, it's great to see Kaohsiung exploring uh, more possibilities in this well, in this approach. And for our next speaker, uh, we invite Dr. Uh, Katsuyaki Takahashi. Uh, from Yokohama City, and um, he will be introducing and he will be sharing uh, challenges to Yokohama City uh, transitioning to net zero, and he will also be sharing a unique urban model for decarbonization. Uh, can we have uh, Dr. Takahashi? Well, can you hear me now? Opening. Okay. Yes. Thank yes. You on the uh, yes. Okay. Where is Takashi? Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Takashi, city of Yokohama. And actually, I'm leaving tomorrow from our country to Dubai. And so I regret that I have left earlier. But anyway, uh, thank you for inviting me to this, uh, this very important uh, meeting. Today, I'd like to uh, explain about uh, our city's action to tackle with smart, uh, climate change. Here shows uh, basic information of our uh, city of Yokohama. Uh, Yokohama is located just uh, west side of Tokyo, and the city with the largest population in Japan. So it's a uh, so urbanized area, but we also have many apartments or houses and also the farms uh, at the northern part of the city. Now I like to explain our challenges uh, and the uh, three points. First one is the uh, energy transition and the uh, urban condition. Uh, Yukama is now uh, actively developing a uh, decarbonized model, especially for large cities. We have Miyat Minai area as a decarbonization leading area which aims to achieve a net zero from electricity consumption in households and uh, business sectors by 2030. This area is a leading business and tourist district in Japan and accounts for only 0.4% of the whole city, where about 10% of energy consumption by the business sector in Yokohama comes from. Thus, our activities for its uh, decarbonization are very challenging, but we will make every effort for net zero society. For securing renewable energy, we install PV on storm water reservoir. Furthermore, we conduct the inter-regional cooperation co efforts. Actually, Yukon has huge population and does not have much open space, and it is difficult to generate a large amount of renewable energy. We estimate it is possible to generate only 10% of our consumption in Yokohama. That's why we signed agreements with 15 municipalities in Tohoku and Kanto region, northeast region of Japan, that have a high potential of renewable energy. And uh, these agreements we like to cooperate together with the application of circulating and ecological sphere concept. Yokohama is also developed in a hydrogen supply chain. Our city is planning to have a hydrogen import base 
and pipelines to supply hydrogen to various factories along the coastline. If possible, hydrogen can be supplied to other urbanized areas, such as Minat Mira district, as I explained earlier, as a decarbonization leading area. And we just launched the uh, uh, Yokama Decarbonization Innovation Council, which is uh, uh, aims for the private, uh, public, uh, public private partnership uh, with 42 companies and organizations in industries, including leading energy and manufacturing companies and the power plants uh, and so on. Secondly, I'd like to explain the demand side approach for attractive lifestyle and net zero. Here shows the uh, uh, energy consumption in Yokohama City. As you can see, uh, the, uh, uh, the volume is decreasing on, in total, but you can uh, understand that uh, uh, energy consumption from household sector uh, at the blue bar, it uh, has been stable. This is a uh, challenging issues for net zero. We understand one of the reasons would be that people cannot easily understand how much they affect climate change, and they also cannot imagine future after net zero. Based on this kind of thought, we have started a new program to innovate and spread attractive lifestyle and a carbon neutral society last year. To reduce life cycle green gas emission, new lifestyle is necessary for various sectors such as fashion, food, house, movement, consumer goods, leisure, and energy. And spread new lifestyle, we believe that it should deliver not only carbon neutral, but attractive future. Under these views, Yokohama is trying to innovate the Nestle local model related to the sustainable and pioneer lifestyle. Lastly, uh, I'd like to point out enhancement of international cooperation. Yokohama is now trying to uh, build a carbon neutral, not only in our city, but in Asia. Uh, we now uh, have a, collab a collaboration with Bangkok, Seoul, and Danan for uh, installing solar uh, generators and uh, energy saving projects. And we also have the uh, 12th Asia Smart City Conference last month, aiming to discuss on the realization of a sustainable city. At the conference, Yokohama Declaration was proposed by Mayor of Bangkok and Yokohama and supported by 44 agencies and organizations from 19 countries. Our city will continue this network for contributing to sustainable society in Asia. And we also have Green Expo in 2027. At this, we now trying to have this expo as a showcase of uh, green transformation, and uh, we welcome every participant to uh, come to this expo. Thank you for your attention, and we all hope to work together to make a uh, carbon neutrality too. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Takahashi. Uh, I, uh, I hope you can stay a little bit longer till the end of this session. Uh, I know it's very late, and thank you. Um, I think Yokohama, has, uh, Yokohama City has set uh, very uh, clear priorities in their roadmap and, and, and open to collaboration with uh, their local communities and, and cooperate, uh, cooperate and also international peers. And I think uh, which essentially leads to um, uh, a collective effort to a uh, low carbon uh, lifestyles and undertaken by most of the citizens. And I certainly look forward to, to the Green Expo in 2027. And then next, I would like to welcome uh, Councilor Nina Ratinanian from the city of Turku. I think Turku was ranked was once ranked one of the smartest uh, city in the world, and uh, at the very stage, uh, has city the city has set a very 
rather ambitious goal to reach climate neutral by 2029. So my question to Nina, so as forerunner in climate actions, uh, what are the barriers and lesson learned that you would like to share with other cities that are in progress of to toward net zero? And also uh, what smart approach do I truly bring us there um, for the net zero goal? And welcome Nina. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Good day and good evening, whatever the time is where you are at the moment. And I want to also start by wishing you a very good thematic day of, of children, youth, education and skills, because what are cities without children and youth? And how can we combat climate change without skills and education? I think this is a very symbolically very important day for cities, regions and subnational uh, authorities. Uh, I also want to compliment previous speakers and your cities. You have made a tremendous work and I recognize many things that we in the city of Turku has already also done or planning to do ahead. I think there is lots, lots of cooperational possibilities between cities and we are very much on the same page because we want to accelerate mitigation, we want to advance adaptation and we want to work for loss and damage. So there's a lot to be done together. Uh, I also represent the European Union Committee of the Regions, which represents over 1 million local decision makers throughout the European Union. And I think that number, over 1 million, represents quite well of the potential that we have in cities and regions. And this is only in European Union. The cities and regions, how much we can we can bring to the climate negotiation tables and to the stock takes and... And lastly, I want to compliment also ICLE and all the other city networks for your your and our great work in COP28 so far. I think that cities and subnational actors have been recognized very well and we have been bringing very good solutions and cr concrete proposals and outcomes to the COP negotiations and shown that cities can deliver like we have seen the previous, previous speeches. Uh, we have also here a climate director of City of Turku, Risto, if you can stand up for a while. <laughs> this is Risto Veivo, so you can also, yes. It's a very good place to applaud because um, I think that behind every successful policies in cities, there must be very good experts that take the take the work, work from year to year forward. Politicians change often, whether we like it or not but the experts are there to carry on the work. So it's very important. And if you want to have more cooperation with Turku, you are also welcome to discuss with Risto later on. So a little bit of city of Turku, which you see in this beautiful picture, uh, it doesn't represent what we have in December, quite far from it, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's a summary picture and very nice city and and very much in the other place of the, of the globe that from the cities we have heard just previously. We have uh, just re reached the goal of uh, over 200,000 inhabitants. And in our region, we have 350,000 inhabitants. I know it doesn't sound that much, but it is the sixth largest city in Finland. We are a large city uh, because Finnish population is not uh, as as large as in so many other countries. But um, we are very proud of our city in so many ways. Uh, Turku is situated in the southwest coast. We are the oldest city in Finland. We have lots of history and we have very dense urban structure, with, which also challenges us when we are planning for carbon neutral future. We have six universities and 50,000 students. So large number of our inhabitants are students, which I think is good because the young people all often demand more climate action from us decision makers and what could be more positive driver for our work than that. We also have very rich nature. Uh, we have a rich archipelago of over 40,000 islands. So welcome also to do some island hopping in Finland and Turku if you ever come to our region. We have a really uh, large harbor in the city and mosaic of industry and service sector. And this is also, um, I think, both challenge and possibility when planning for climate action because we have to have policies in so many different sectors 
bring everyone along and and the more diverse your uh, economy is, the more possibilities there lie. Okay, we can go to the next slide. These are some of our objectives in city of Turku. And what um, I think is the most important is that we try to be carbon neutral by 2029, which is, which is the birthday of our city for 800 years. And after that, climate positive. Um, I was a city councillor some 10 years ago when we set our carbon neutrality target to 2040. But uh, we had to heave the goal closer to today, to 2029 from 2040, because we were able to cut emissions so fast that 2040, it was too far ahead. So we made a, a goal, a strategic goal to become carbon neutral by 2029 and soon after climate positive city. We have been already able to reduce 55% of the carbon uh, of the greenhouse gases from 1990 levels by 2020. So we have been in, in the, among the cities of Finland the fastest one to cut emissions. And I think this also demonstrates that it's quite possible to cut emissions. It's it's um like like we often say, climate change is a it's an Gigantic challenge, but we already have the solutions on how to combat climate change. And I think that Turku has demonstrated well that it is possible. We are also um, connecting our biodiversity plan to the uh, climate planning because, uh, of course, biodi lots of biodiversity, natural environments, carbon sinks, it's very close to uh, combating climate crisis and everything is interconnected. So we already also have ambitious goals on biodiversity and environments. And also sustainable use of natural resources is of course important. And, and we have had a, we have made also a, a really good and comprehensive roadmap for circular economy because, because the targets we set as cities of, of UNFCCC, of different parties, they are quite ambitious often, and because the because the targets are ambitious, they require quite ambitious policies. And I think we are in the we are on the road of achieving our carbon neutrality. Of course, we need to do much more work, and it's often so that the let's say the the easiest and economically most beneficial uh, policies are taking always first taken always first and then in the last phase we have maybe the more difficult that we really need to think ahead and also that we really need to communicate to our citizens and bring different stakeholders with us so that we don't only introduce the policies but we invite people businesses universities everyone along to also plan with us and that is the way that we can achieve carbon neutrality in 2029 and also 1.5 degree lifestyle, which is a new project that Turku has established because to be able to cut the emissions but live a, lead a sustainable lifestyle, we also need to invite people to, to act along with the 1.5 targets. I think something that... Uh, some positive example of the 1.5 uh, lifestyle I could bring to you today is that, uh, in my opinion, Finnish people have a mentality of wanting to make choices by themselves. They want to. They don't want anyone to choose pro for them. They want to choose themselves, and by bringing variety of choices to make on how sustainable lifestyle, sustainable living is possible. Uh, they can choose the best way for them. And this is this project uh, has invited, for example, local businesses to bring their ideas to showcase for the citizens, for our residents, what the solutions are that they can choose from. So offering also a variety of solutions is important so people can still have the possibility to, to make their own choices of, of what is the best way for them. And we can go forward. Uh, this is some some uh, technical numbers for uh, our carbon neutrality plan by 2029. 
and showcases some of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions per capita in cities of Finland, for example, just to showcase very briefly on where we are and what we have been doing. Uh, I mentioned also uh, circular economy, which is quite important aspect. It is not only the carbon, well, sustainable future and green transition cannot be achieved, of course, only by carbon neutrality and cutting emissions. And that is why circular economy is so important. Uh, in our circular economy a plan, development plan, we have uh, phases of material circulation, new clean energy sources, and strengthening carbon sinks. And by that plan, we can also reduce, of course, emissions and do it very effectively and generate new business, which is important uh, for the region. And I'm proud to say that while we have been able to cut so much emissions, at the same time, we have been able to increase the population of the city and also economic growth of the city. So that, I think, is a concrete example of uh, climate action not taking away anything from development of the cities. And uh, I really, really think that uh, we as cities can also showcase that to national governments quite often because we are very quick to act. Uh, we are quick to show results and see results. And we are quick to, we are able to communicate this, uh, how these solutions are scalable to national governments as well. Um, lastly, lastly, um, we have so many good proposals. I don't even know what I want to raise in the last phase. So maybe I will just uh, thank you at this moment and, and also uh, emphasize that then the next phase we are, I think, reaching because we have been able to cut emissions so much. We have been able to draw many roadmaps, strategies and circular economy. The next phase is also the more holistic approach to bring people with us. And of, of that, the, the 1.5 degree lifestyle is a good example. And we have had some climate for us where we have been inviting people, citizens, residents and businesses to come along and discuss of the common future. Because I think that in general, people want to be part of something bigger. And in cities, because we are so close to people, we are able to demonstrate how the global challenges can be challenged in city level and how the people can be part of the solution. If we just plan ahead and, and make concrete platforms so that people can participate, they are quite ready to do so. And the one difficult thing we have ahead towards carbon neutrality is transforming our mobility system. And, and because, because it requires, of course, lots of investments, but also lots of behavioral change of the people. So invi by inviting people along, we, we also make them agencies of change. That is important. And very lastly, I think that part of success is also uh, bringing really everyone along with climate planning. I'm really proud of the fact that when we uh, have been taking our carbon neutrality decision in the city council and uh, and adopted our climate strategy, the both time it has been a unanimous unanimous decision. And I think this uh, ensures also the stability of policies and stability of the longstanding, longstanding vision that our city has. And it's also, I think, communicates, for example, to local businesses, that this is the place to invest in green transition. You can trust that we take forward to change we will take forward a sustainable future. So I also think that it's very important to send this message that it is not just for this year, not for this parliamentary term, not for four years. We are on this road to be there forever and ever until climate change is over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. It's very uh, inspiring remarks. And um, 
I think Turku illustrated the point very nicely that uh, setting ambitious commitment, uh, commitment and taking ambitious uh, strategy of actions and engage all stakeholders and uh, especially in the next generations that really uh, bring more opportunity and it also supports uh, from the whole society that would truly uh, realize and also scale up the solutions uh, for, for our cities. And thank you. Uh, last but not, List, I would like to welcome Maria Cantore. Uh, she's also joining us uh, online, and she's the um, Director General of the International Relations uh, from the Argentine, uh, from Rosario, Argentina. Um, and she will be sharing in us uh, innovative policy called Agro. Uh, ecological food protection, which demonstrate uh, what really makes city smart, not with uh, really technology, but also uh, solve problems for in its inhabitants. Uh, welcome, and um, the floor is yours, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you, and it's a pleasure to be collaborating with cities such as Kaohsiung and Shokohama and Kuru and also with organizations such as Ikle and, and your organization. So thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to showcase to you uh, one of our policies. I believe it's still uh, relevant, even though it has many years. Um, we can move, move forward with the presentation. And just to showcase to you, Rosario has almost 1 million people and is surrounded by uh, wetlands and also by the humid pampas. So we are in the center of one of the most important parts of the world that produces food, uh, mostly in traditional ways. So uh, we have a lot of uh, green spaces, but not in all parts of the city, mostly located in certain um, riverside uh, areas. So we are a port city and an industrial city as well as services. Um, we can move forward. Uh, so we have an, a climate action plan uh, divided into different objectives in adaptation and mitigation. And I will be talking about one of the adaptation points, which is biodiversity and soil. Um, and in another time, maybe we can talk about the general uh, plan of the city in climate action. We can go to the next one. And in reduction, we have the objective of reducing 22% by 2030. And one of the main areas we will be doing that is in waste because energy is not uh, provided by the city, it's on the provincial level. So we have less uh, power over that. So we are focusing uh, a lot on waste um, but also, as I mentioned, um, to fo foster and uh, improve our biodiversity and green areas all around the city. That's why if we go to the next one, I will uh, showcase to you how Rosario is innovating in urban food production to achieve a more sustainable future. As you see, we have a big river um, in our city that it's called the Paraná which is one of the most important rivers in South America. Um, going to the next one. Um, so we have two programs um, and we are having these long-term public policies. The first one is the Urban Agricultural Program and the second one is the Rosario Green Belt. I will start telling you about the Urban Agricultural Program and it started in 2002 because we had a big economic crisis in 2001. So that's why the local governments took uh, initiatives and ideas that were, were already in civil society uh, of different organizations working in urban agriculture. So in degraded lands uh, in uh, the city to have small uh, spaces to produce food. And the local government took this idea and promoted it uh, with universities to see these um, degraded areas uh, in the most peripheric and vulnerable, vulnerable areas in the city, if they could be useful for uh, food. And it was made a transformation to have, as we will see in the next slide, um, different uh, objectives. Um, Yes, so 
Uh, in this uh, program, we have um, mostly public lands, uh, and in those public lands, um, there's different families that produce food. Uh, well, one of the objectives is obviously to have sustainable food production and also guaranteeing access to agroecological food, not only to the producers that first they could use that food for themselves, uh, but also to generate this access to food, to healthy food for the residents of Rosario. Right now, we can say that approximately 200,000 uh, people have access to agroecological vegetables thanks to these programs. Obviously, this simulates the local economy. And first of all, for these producers and these families in the most difficult areas of the city, uh, and also the social inclusion uh, of these uh, families and the small producers. But besides of that, uh, this gives us a big environmental services, having in mind that some of the most important risks that our city have are related to heat and heat waves and also with flooding. So generating new green spaces with biodiversity because it also has different kinds of uh, trees and bushes and different um, insects and different species that are there, but also that helps us with the heat island effect and with the absor absorption and um, the uh, fostering absorbent land so we can reduce uh, flooding. Um, so we will see in the next one some of the numbers. We have uh, nine allotment gardens, two are new this year, managed by the local governments uh, who provides training, but then uh, inside, inside of that gardens are the families, uh, local producers that really uh, use the lands to then sell agroecological food. We also have community gardens and entrepreneur centers uh, where um, we promote differ different uh, technical aspects and uh, marketing aspects of this uh, agricultural program. We will see in the next one, uh, the other parts, uh, the other policy that was integrated, this was um, officially uh, made part of the public policies of Rosario in 2016. So a few years later, but in 2013, uh, we, the city made a local law, um, basically reserving a big part of the land of Rosario for fruit and vegetable pro uh, production. As you can see, it's 800 hectares. So this means uh, the, um, the food production in that area is uh, secured by different uh, local ordinances and laws so right now we have um, 126 hectares under agroecological production and 157 in agroecological transition. So these, um, these lands are different because they are private, private lands and the government, the local government, what we do is to promote and to help producers to do this agroecological transition. Uh, obviously it's uh, voluntary, so these, uh, the producers that want to, new, to, to know new techniques and have new skills to do this transition, the local government helps them. Obviously, there's many challenges and it's not easy, but we see uh, more producers uh, interested in uh, going into the agroecological production. So this, as you can see, this green belt gives us a really big um, climatic and environmental uh, benefits, which is to reserve, reserve this green space, uh, which the main uh, climatic uh, benefit is to, as I mentioned, to reduce flooding. Uh, we have this river, but we also have two streams uh, that go uh, around the city. So this has many benefits, not only economic, social, but also uh, environmental. So if we can go to the following, we will see this is a big important part and one of the main areas of what the government does, which is also to help in the marketing of these products, especially for the urban agricultural producers. Without this, it would be really difficult for them to 
to have this kind of income. Uh, the local government creates and has maintained um, these markets uh, or fairs, which are in certain days and are established uh, where different uh, parts of the population of Rosario can access to this food uh, in, um, in a food price range similar to other uh, food that is not agroecological. So it's accessible. And this means that uh, we uh, have uh, around 6,300 tons of agroecological food per year. And um, involved in this process, both in the urban and very urban uh, agriculture, we have uh, 500 producers, most of them are women. So the marketing aspect is really important for this to be a, a good source of income for these families. If we go to the following, uh, well, some of these uh, ideas is that we, this kind of uh, agroecological food production creates synergies in different agendas with nature-based solutions. Uh, having in mind food security, climate adaptation, and urban resilience. Uh, as I, I didn't mention before, most of the vegetables from Rosario come from another city 400 kilometers away. So all the food that we can provide locally is really important to reduce GHG emissions um, and also to have in mind that even though some cities I know they don't have a lot of available land, we know that uh, this can be done in small lands as well. This can be applied in houses, of course, and we are promoting that. So we believe this solution can be applied in different scales all, all around the world. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. Um, unfortunately, we are running a bit over time, so we don't have uh, time for uh, for open floor to the questions. So um, I'll just wrap up here. And I think uh, from the previous case that we, uh, we've we seen uh, the message is quite clear. We have uh, challenges that is getting complex, but we do have options and we do have uh, solutions. So the point is now how we do it tomorrow and uh, how we do it uh, with, with, with each other and with, with uh, collaboration. And uh, thank you all that for joining us today. And uh, I wish you uh, great for the rest of the day. Thank you.